All right, can you hear me out there now? I don't know why it always changes the settings. I, I save them, but they don't seem to save. So uh, give me a little uh, yes or no, people. Can you hear me okay? Let's give a little uh, music test, people. See if uh, not loud enough, too loud maybe. Let's check it out. Okay, I'm assuming the guitar is way low in the mix. All right, we'll turn that up. We'll turn that up, and here we go. Rock and roll. If it's a little low on your end, turn up your speaker. If it's too loud, turn it down. Let's check it out. Uh, you probably didn't hear what I was saying before. Um, I just assumed that my settings were correct and everybody could hear me. Silly. Um, this is an older Eidolon song, which is a band that me and my brother had prior to Megadeth, which actually that was really the band that actually got us into that band. Um, and although we're still somewhat active, not real heavily, um, this is one of the albums that we did for Metal Blade back in 2003. It's called Apostles of Defiance. It's one of my favorites out of the uh, four or five that we did with those guys. Um, let's check it out. Thank <laughs> you. 
since I played that song, so it wasn't picture perfect by any means, but it was fun nonetheless. And also, too, um, just as I always mention when I'm doing my other online clinic stuff, is that if there's anything that I play and anything that catches your anybody's attention, uh, any parts of the you know song, you know, might be a part of a riff or a solo or something, don't hesitate to, uh, to bring it up, and I can um, possibly break it down, providing it's not too ex you know, extensive. Let me uh, catch up on our questions here, if there's any. Okay, Robert, what's the best way? Just hold off for any new questions, guys. Let's let me catch up. What's the best way to develop right-hand picking technique? You've heard it before, and it's very, very true. The best way, the best workout is the chromatics, in my opinion. You can, you can use any kind of scale or whatever you want you know, three note per string patterns, two notes, four notes, whatever. I just like to use the chromatics because it really helped me in a big way because in my teens, I got to my later teens and I, I was like, I got to a point where I, I just noticed all of my heroes all picked with these two fingers. Everybody did, except for Eddie Van Halen is the only one I've ever seen. But everybody's with these two fingers. So I figured, well, I, I'm doing something wrong because when I started playing guitar, I didn't have a teacher. We, there was no teachers back then, you know, in the small town that I lived. It was all we learned off each other. You know, the kids in the town, we, you know, the ones that picked up the guitar, we would, you know, kind of get together and swap riffs that we learned, you know, Zeppelin riffs and Sabbath and all that kind of stuff. So nobody had any proper direction. We just kind of learned off each other. And... Um, which was a lot of fun, I might, I might add. But uh, so I got to a point, I was like, man, I, I think this is really working against me because I use these two fingers. So I spent about a good half a year switching over to using these two fingers, went through a lot of these exercises. In the end, I found it just wasn't working and it was a lot better for me to go back to where I was. For whatever reason, it just works better with me. Be it, maybe it's just the way I started. I don't know, but that's, I went back to that and never looked back. So, um, but one thing that really helped me, again, with the strength of my right hand, the coordination of two hands, because that's really important, obviously, um, and the dexterity of the left hand, too, which is extremely important, because a lot of times when we first get into, get into solo patterns, we're using multiple fingers, it kind of looks like this, you know? You know, all that kind of stuff, right? Everybody goes through these growing pains. What you do is... Um, over time, you'll find that you you know your your left hand becomes just, just gain better formation in the left hand, where the fingers start to become closer to the frets. You get that economy of motion thing happening, which is very important. So 
So with the chromatic stuff, there is no rules. You can design your own patterns. The way I do it is I take two strings at a time. It's rhythmic, and it's I'm not taking too much of a chunk of strings at once because it can become a little bit tiring. Um, and then I'll start with, um, of course, the, the two top strings, the five and the six. And I'll start with the four note per string patterns. So it'll be on the sixth string, of course, one, two, three, four. And everything you do on the sixth string, you copy on the fifth string. So one, two, three, four, and the six, one, two, three, four, and the five, of course, two, three, four, five, two, three, four, five. And you just move up chromatically, half or a half step at a time uh, in a chromatic shape, chromatic shapes. And for me, what I do is I'll go all the way to when my first finger reaches the 12th fret and then go back. And then I'll take the next two set of strings, the five and the four, and then the four and the three, and so forth. I'm going to play it a little bit more up to speed, so it doesn't take me a year to fly through it. But this is what it looks like up to speed. I'm not really warmed up for this, but here we go. Try again. And then back, you know. So, again, I'm not really warmed up, so it's a little choppy, but you get the general idea. And, you know, slow it down, it's just... Like you know, and always making sure if you, when you play it slow, you're playing it like that, of course, but make sure that when you're bringing it up to speed, when you're ready for it, it doesn't happen really in five minutes, so you gotta be patient. Uh, make sure you're not picking any differently. A lot of people tend to double pick when they get played faster. So now you're not playing it the same. However you play it slow, you got to play it the same when you're playing it fast. Right? So, and then I'll do that. And then... Um, you can take that and go backwards too. You can uh, reverse the chromatic shape. So it's like. On, 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 on. And then I'll go three notes per string. So it'll be one, two, three, one, two, three, two, three, four, two, three, four. You know, and um, and with the three note per string thing, there's a couple of different patterns you can do. You can do the one, two, three, or you can do one, two, four, or one, three, four, right? So I take the one, two, three, move that up chromatically and back, and then do the other ones. So it's... So, and then again, just do that, go through all these possibilities, make your own designs, to take two strings at a time, and work your way till you get to the first and second string. If you do that 15, 20 minutes a day, you're going to notice a huge increase in your accuracy, strength, and um, unlike me this morning because I haven't practiced it for a little bit, uh, and your dexterity with the left hand. So. Providing you're a right-hand guitar player like me. Hopefully that will help. I know it will help in a big way. And uh, you should all be doing that. But anyway. And for Mark, yeah, good idea with the Black Star app. You can't go wrong. It's a great little combo. Lisa, um, do you still play a lot with your brother? Uh, well, it's a little bit different now because he's got his band that he formed with Chris, which is called Active Defiance, after they left Megadeth. 
and um, they do that thing. Uh, that's just his thing that he does. Um, I help him with the demos for the albums and stuff like that, but I'm not in the band. Um, but we do recordings and stuff together. Yeah, we're always working on songs, be it, you know, stuff I'm doing or he's doing a lot of session work. Because I have a lot of people that uh, that we work with that are some of you in the room could be interested in this kind of thing or maybe doing this yourself. A lot of people are going into getting into the home recordings these days. But there's a lot of people that, you know, they'll have the equipment with computers and stuff like that, have a setup, but not necessarily have all the means to be able to record what they want to record. So in my studio, we've been getting involved in doing that. So I'm working with, you know, artists that, you know, from, from all levels, not just, you know, guys that have been playing for however long, but beginners, you know, helping people craft songs, put songs together. Like a, a typical example would be, you know, one of my, my, uh, students, we can call them, um, will come up with a riff and then I'll help them maybe extend, you know, or, or expand on the riff and try to create a song. And then we'll get my brother to come in, do the drums. I'll help with the bass and the guitar and, you know, kind of a collaboration online, which is a very common thing these days. So we've been getting into a lot of that kind of session work with people and stuff like that, which is a lot of fun. And people are getting stuff that they, you know, they're wanting to promote and have name attachments and uh, as well as being able to, to maybe record stuff that they didn't think they would be able to. Um, not only because of maybe lack of, you know, being able to do certain things, but also just uh, uh, playing wise, but also technical, the technical side of like the equipment. So we, we do a lot of that stuff. Yeah. But as far as playing in a band together right now, no, I do a lot of this stuff at home. It, it occupies most of my time. Um, you know, I'll go up and do some stuff with Testament here and there when they're on tour and do some fill in stuff and have some fun, but uh, nothing real serious as far as a, a full time band for me at this point. Just give me a sec, guys, for questions. I'm still behind, so just bear with me. For John, in a live setting, what does your rig consist of? From guitar to amp in between for live well there's a couple of different things um i just got a kemper so i might be like with testament we use kempers um with the stuff that, oh incidentally like one thing i didn't mention is the uh the night of metal thing that we have it's called the night of metal and it's a project that we have uh, me sean ripper owens from priest and bay malmstein and the old idol on basis uh adrian um we do like kind of like that thing that Hale, the band Hale does overseas, where it's guys from all these bands, the more iconic bands like Megadeth, you know, Slayer, um, uh, Priest, all these bands like that. We go out and play tribute to these the bands that we were in, playing those songs, and all its relative bands, Sabbath, Iron Maiden, yada, yada, yada. So when I do that stuff, we do that periodically, incidentally. Um, we just started the first show ever done like that. Actually, that kind of concept done here in, in my, my neck of the woods it was in Toronto back in March, and it went very, very well. So now we're expanding. We're going to be doing a bunch of more shows starting in October. But anyways, for that kind of thing, I'll probably use the GSP, which is the Digitech GSP 101 preamp rack. And I use that with a Control 2 MIDI control panel board, footboard which is a really simple setup because the uh, control two is powered by an ethernet cable that you plug into the GSP, which powers the unit. It's really cool actually. And it's very easy to use. It sounds killer. Um, switching presets is amazing. There's no gaps. It's just, it's just a really great system. And um, I don't, I might use an external overdrive, but most of the time just for simplicity, I just use the internal pedal emulations that are inside the GSP, uh, the one I use is the tube screen emulation. And then that's plugged into either a power amp or a, a like say a Marshall or a PV head. It's got to be tube um, because it's just not the same with this particular processor. If you go transistor, I try it, it doesn't work. The sound is just not there. And you just go into the effects loop return. So the guitar goes into the front of the GSP. And then out of the GSP, it goes into the effects loop return only of the head and then out of the head speakers right into your cabinet or cabinets. And it's uh, it's quite the monstrous setup. It sounds amazing. So even though I have the Kemper now, 
which is an incredible piece of equipment. I'll probably still maintain that setup for those shows because of its simplicity and how good it sounds. Um, whereas the Kemper, really, I bought it more so for, you know, just having the versatility at home and in the studio for reamping with people. There's a lot of people asking me to do reamping for them. So uh, the, uh, the Kemper is designed to do that kind of stuff as well as, you know, just going direct out of it and, you know, and, and, and choosing the rig that you want and doing your thing. So it's more of a studio workhorse. Although it can be used live too, like I say in Testament, we use those live. And um, this particular model that I have, just like the Testament ones, which is, this is the same one as the ones we use in Testament. It's uh, called the Powerhead and it's, um, it's got its own 600 watt power amp built in. So it could be easily used live, but anyways, I have those choices, but we'll probably still stick with the GSP. How's that? Okay. Brian, do you think it's bad to use chromatics on all six strings? Is how I find no, I'm not, I'm not at all. That's why I was saying you can design your own designs. You know, um, it's there's no rules with it. It's whatever you want to do. The main thing is you're moving and you're doing it properly. That, that's the main things. You make sure whatever you're doing, you're playing it. You're in sync, you know, and 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 you're just playing. You're doing the exercises properly. So, like I said, when you get up to the higher tempos, make sure you're not double picking. You know, people have a tendency to do that, going from. You know, just make sure you're not doing any of that stuff. You know. A million different ways you can do that stuff, you know, but I find it's just something that, you know, because it takes, it, you're covering a lot of ground, you, it's more of an intense focused workout rather than just doing scales. Okay, I'm going to do this scale. Okay, that's done. I'm going to do this one. It's just more of a kind of really condensed thing, you know, and it keeps you moving consistently. And like I said, it just really works out those three important things when you're getting into alternate picking, you know, um, where we're doing single note patterns, you know, that, you know, you're building up the strength with the alternate picking, you're, you're building that strength and coordination with the two hands, the synchronization and the uh, dexterity in the left hand to where it's, you know, you're having proper left hand technique. <laughs> And yes, what you're hearing is the Kemper. It's going through my console and coming out through monitors. In case anybody's wondering what I'm using today. Okay, Dan. I have an issue string muting with the left hand, trying to mute the strings above the one I'm playing. It's a loaded question. Um, let me read that again. Okay, I got all right. I understand that. Okay, see, so yeah, I think I'm getting it. You're trying to mute strings above, you're trying to mute other strings from so they're not ringing out while you're doing certain things, correct? Is that what you're, that what you're trying to say here? I think that's what I'm getting. Um, I wouldn't. I don't know if I would do that. I just have a tendency to when I'm doing. It's a combination of. It's a combination of the left and right hand when you're muting. You know, I have a tendency to do that. Like just this simple thing, for example. Like we'll take the Megadeth. Right, really simple example. This is maybe a little exercise you can use to get in, to get used to this because this is a situation where these are techniques that once you get them down, you just do them and they don't, you don't even think about it. It's just like going into autopilot. It just happens. 
that's why a lot of things I have to look back and what I'm doing and how I'm doing it. Oh, okay, that's how I do it type of thing. Um, and that's what happens. But at first, we have to analyze and make sure what the hell is going on and get it down right. So when you take this riff, as you can see, what I'm doing is I'm just I'm taking those thing, the middle fingers there in this particular situation anyway, and I'm just you know just throwing them down on the strings real lightly, you know, just to stop them from ringing. But I'm also doing the same thing with my right hand here. You know, but if I just do it with just the right hand without the left hand, it's not quite muted properly. You know, you're still, but to completely stop it, I use both hands. So if you break this down and you play it real slow, and you can see what's going on and get used to it and, and build that, get the idea in your head and, and uh, you know, just get coordinated so you can do it properly. You might fumble a little bit, like I say, you know, initially, but when you get used to doing it and using all these kind of different patterns helps. So I always try to push people to play along with music, you know, because when you're playing with uh, along with different kinds of pre-recorded music, there's going to be a lot of examples like songs like that. Very simple riff to play, but it, it works on doing these mutings and stuff like that, you know, and cleaning things up and playing things properly. And again, there, dan, dan, dan. it's a combination of the right and the left hand. Palm muting. Without it, there you have that, right? Claws. Okay, you're, I think what you're asking is uh, what modes are used to get darker a darker sound. Modes, I, I tend to really not say, okay, I'm going to use a particular mode to do something because there's a lot of modes that, even though they're very important to learn, um, it's there's a lot of similarities to them. So sometimes people can't hear the difference between them because they're so similar. But, I mean, if you're talking about darker types of, well, I mean, harmonic minor is one, it's not a mode, but I mean, it's involved. Well, Style, you know, so harmonic minor. You've heard that before, you know. So you got the harmonic kind of thing, harmonic minor thing that's, that gives it that kind of weird, kind of exotic thing, as we know. As well as just, you know, melodic minor. I just, I use a lot of that. patterns with melodic minor you know so with the metal stuff we tend to wait to stay away from the more you know major positive sounding kind of vibe style you know but those are probably the most um, widely used ones but like I said I'm not gonna the modes it, I find using those as, as uh, examples can be confusing Robert, how do you approach individual instrument parts in the studio? What order do you record song parts? Great question. Um, again, there are no rules. You could do it various ways. Some people like to take a click track and play and, and record their guitars and then put drums on it and then everything else. For me, there is, in my opinion, there is only one way. Because if you take a click track and you record your guitars, then you get the drummer to play on top of that. Yes, you can use Beat Detective and you can edit in, in Pro Tools or whatever DAW you're using on the edit page and you can whip everything into shape and it's real, real tight. But for me, 
it's important to maintain the human feel. I think that's why a lot of stuff that you listen to these days, or there's some stuff, I won't say a lot, but there's stuff out there that has that plasticky kind of sound. That's why, because it's just corrected too much. It's too, you got to have a little bit of the human swing in there, you know? All the classic records have that. And um, so I'm very, very much into making sure that's present. And the only way for me to do that, the, the only way you should do that rather, is my procedure is if a song is written, if I, if I write a song, just give an example, if I write a song, here's the music, here's the guitar riff, I put it all together, all I need to have is, is, is the drums laid down. I'll take that guitar structure of the song I'll record it all to a click track, but as a dummy guitar, meaning that if there's mistakes or I didn't play it perfect, it doesn't matter. It's just there for the drummer to know where he is in the song. And then the drum track is applied. And then once the drum track is applied, then I'll take the click out. I, I And if, if it's tight enough, I, I don't correct anything with beat detective or anything on, the, on, on an acoustic drum track, like when, say, when Sean comes in. You know, I'll get him to play it as, as you know, as get the performance as tight as I can because I don't want to touch beat detective unless I have to because, again, it soaks up that human feel and brings into the robotics, which uh, I don't like. And I know there's a lot of people out there that don't as well. So I'm very old school that way, and I believe that's the way music should be. It's about the human and self-expression, not uh, a robot. So I'll take... Once the drum track is, is, you know, everything is cool, then I'll go back and I'll record the, the real guitars to the drum track, not to the click track, to the drums. The drums is, is what drives the ship. You lock into the drums. When you play live, the drummer doesn't play to you. You play to the drummer when you're all playing together, that is. So, you know, if you're playing with the drummer, you ever notice if the drummer slows down or speeds up, you're going to just adapt. You don't think about it. It just happens unless you have really bad rhythm. So that's just the way it goes. So it's important to do that, I think. You play your keeper guitars to the finished drum track and you put the bass on, vocals, solos, whatever the combination of instruments. Um, if it's a typical drums, bass, guitar, vocal situation, drums, guitar, bass, vocals, and then solos in the end. Because um, the reason I like to do to solos in the end is that Sometimes the vocal might end, you might hang on to a note, let's say there's a, a bridge or a chorus, let's say, before the solo section. And he hangs on to a note, you know, that goes into the solo section. You start on the one, so there's a carryover of the vocals, and you come in, and, you know, it, and there might be a clash of notes. You might be hanging on a note, you know, that clashes with the note that starts off in the solo, if you understand what I'm saying. And uh, so that's why, as a rule, I'll always do the solos in the end. I'm saying that I might do dummy solos before the vocals are laid down so the vocalist knows where not to sing, you know. Um, but I'll make sure there's nothing in his way. So that's the way I do it, you know. Um, obviously, the vocals are more important than the solos, in my opinion, anyway. Some people might dispute that. Um, and um, that's my procedure, which I feel is makes most sense. That's, um, you know, to get the proper production uh, of performance. So, because again, the, the drums don't fall, you know, you play, you get the drummer to play, the, the guitar is cool, but you're going to be like this from each other here and there. Whereas if you have the drums, you follow the drums and you play as tight as you can with those drums. It's harder to do it the other way around because it's not natural. That's not how it goes. If you're playing a song and everybody's playing along, you're in a rehearsal room or you're playing live, he speeds up, you speed up. If you're not gonna speed up above the drums, like I said, unless you have horrible rhythm and you have no idea what's going on, that's not gonna happen. You're just gonna play with the drums and he drives it and you fluctuate along with him. That's why you do it that way. Okay, cool, Brian. But the yeah, but the picking up. Jack, do you think the notes and then play them while writing songs, or do you try a bunch and choose the correct ones? You talking about a 
okay, writing a song. Well, it applies to solos as well. So I'll, two questions, basic, or, or, or I'll answer both in one shot. Um, if you're indeed thinking about that as well, um, there's not. Yeah, it's you know I will do a thing where, like I mentioned, I'll get a structure of a song. And there might be a couple of parts I'm not, they're not real polished and I'm not 100% on what I, I know it's what I want, but it still needs to be refined. I might still just lay down the dummy and then polish it later. I do that a lot. Because some riffs might need to be refined or, or I might find later on after a week, nah, I don't like that note there or that pattern. I'm going to change that. Then you just go and change it, you know, making sure, of course, it makes sense with the drums. This is where editing comes in. You know, um, that's the beauty of Pro Tools and all these DAW systems these these days that you have. Unlike before with the tape machines, it was a lot more a lot harder to do these things. Now we're able to edit parts of drums anywhere, guitars, anything, to make sure things are making sense and working with each other. These things couldn't be achieved really to this extent as they can be these days, which is, that's one of the good things about computer recording. I don't like everything about rec uh, computer recording. But there's so many cool things about it with editing and automation with mixing that it would be hard for me to go back to what I used to do because I've been doing this for almost 25 years now, what I call studio home engineering. I started back in the early 90s and it was all tape machines, reel to reel machines, ADAT machines, and then I went into Pro Tools with Mac. So um, it's been quite the journey, but certain things that we're exposed to now, it makes it harder to go back because of the open doors that we have now. So I guess that's why I put up with some of the torment. Technology can be a pain, but uh, there's a lot of great things it's brought us as well. Let me see here. Oh. Am I a fan of Eric Johnson? Yeah, he's great. He's not one of the guys that I sit down and listen to necessarily for pleasure. Um, but I respect the guy a lot. He's great. Absolutely. Marilyn, what do I think of power chords? They're a necessity. It's uh, something that you use. It's uh, it's in almost every Black Sabbath song. You know, it's what I started with, you know, when I first started being able to play along with my records and stuff like that. I learned power, power chords, you know, Paranoid. You know? You know? All that stuff it's all the beginnings of what i learned and it's still used in in most hard rock and metal songs to this day and i think always will be used it's just it's one of the biggest parts of, of hard rock music you know is bar chords <laughs> On the gear note, if you have an almost metal gain, if you have, you want to switch between songs live more me mellow. Uh, good question. Okay, David, so the question about when I'm switching from a metal tone to like a clean tone, or if you want to roll off kind of thing. I've never really got into the roll off thing, although you could do that with the Kemper now. I haven't got into the, per the parameters and how to do that, but there is a setting where you can go in and where you're in a distorted tone and you roll off the, the volume on your guitar and it will go clean. You know, you can, you can set it up for that. Um, but I don't, I think a lot of the stuff that I, I do live never really calls for that. Hold on. It's getting a little hot in here. So I have to put this stupid thing on. Um, pretty much it's usually, you know, I'll go from rhythm to clean, you know, but there's three main channels I'll always use pretty much, which is my main distortion, a lead one, which is basically will be the pretty much the same tone as my main distorted channel, but with delay and a boost. And then I'll have a clean tone. And then I might have some, you know, like something might have, a, uh, like say the song, 
like when we do the uh, the night of metal shows, we'll usually do Heaven and Hell. And so when I get into the solo section, because there's a section in the middle, we do the live version. So I do a solo for like five minutes or whatever it is. I'll throw on like a modulation, like a, a univibe or something. So I'll have a, a lead tone that's the same as the other one, but just a variance where it has the univibe. There might be songs like the Maiden songs that we do that have the harmonies in them. So I'll have patches for that where I can do the, the harmonies because it's only one guitar player. Um, but the standard patches are just the three, the, the main distortion, the lead, and the clean. But I'm not, I don't roll off because it's just, I haven't, we haven't really, stuff I've, I've always done live is really, there has really been very little call for it. Um, as far as I can remember, anyway, there might be a couple little things along the way that I did, maybe in King Diamond, but for the most part, it's like that. And a lot of times, too, you know, where I might go from, like, say, a solo into a clean part, let's say, or back to the rhythm, the uh, the GSP has what's called a delay spillover. So if you have a preset that you're using, in this case, the lead one, and there's delay on it, when I switch back to my main preset or the clean, the delay will spill over. So it's got a really nice kind of smooth kind of um, entry going back into whatever preset you're, you know, the main one or whatever it is. So it's just a, that's a very cool option to have that. So, so it's not like abrupt cuts, you know, it doesn't, it's, I have it where it's all pretty smooth. Brian, I noticed you used a few blue notes. Could you kind of explain the concept for us? I don't really understand what you mean by blue notes. If you can expand on that one or elaborate. Jeremy, so many greats, guitar greats from the 60s and 80s became great uh, teachers. Uh, yeah, well, that's because that's what it was, you know, going back to what I was talking about before. I grew up, you know, in the late 70s, early 80s. Um, you know, in a small town outside of Montreal, Canada, and there was there's no, there was no teachers, you know, and if there was in some kind of school somewhere in Montreal, you know, you'd be learning things that you didn't want to learn, you know, and when you're a kid, 12 years old, 14 years old, whatever, you want to be learning stupid things like, you know, I mean, well, I should say stupid things, but there's certain things that maybe become important later, but initially are not important. I think when somebody starts playing, they shouldn't worry about the things that people tell them to learn to worry about, which is scales, extensive chord learning. You should be playing what you, why are you playing guitar? Well, because I like Black Sabbath. Okay, well then you should learn some Sabbath songs and have fun and start to just get things moving, have some fun with it, and then see where it goes. And if you become serious with it, you feel like it's something that you're becoming good at and you want to pursue, then you can get more extensive. But initially, you should just have some fun. And that's what I believe because, to me, that's common sense. I don't think that, you know, the whole thing of, well, when you start guitar, you should play acoustic first because then it'll be easier when you play electric. We've all heard that one. That's an old myth, and it doesn't hold any water. You should be playing something that's easy and, and fun and feels good and have some fun with it. Learn the stuff that you want. Hey, I know how to, I know how to play the beginning of Smoke in the Water, you know, which everybody learns at first, whatever song it is. Start off small, have fun, and start to build your inventory. And like I said, if you, if you feel like it's something for you, you'll know at a certain point. Because, you, okay, and then you figure, okay, I'm going to start buying some equipment, and then I want to, you know, climb that mountain and that mountain. That's what you should be always looking at. Oh, okay, Matt, I understand. I don't know, you know, to tell you the truth, I don't really, sometimes I'll just kind of just go off a little bit and throw different things in, and it might not necessarily be the same every time. It all depends on, because I really am more reactive to music. I'm not a guy that plans out every note that comes up next. I'm not a guy that will sit there and play the same series of notes and play it six million times and do that night after night. I can do that. I choose not to. Because I don't feel that's musical self-expression. I think self-expression comes from feeling the music and being inspired and reacting. All the greats, like Deep Purple, when you listen to some of their, if you listen to live stuff, 
There's a lot of live versions of songs that you will hear. They're always different. There's different solos. I'm not saying you should always just alienate what you've done. I'm not saying that the same, the, 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 the um, expression part of music is they'll always be kind of reacting to each other, you know, and that's where a lot of the, the cool stuff comes from. And um, of course, that's the dynamic of, say, a band like Deep Purple. Maybe that was a, that wasn't the best example to use, I suppose. I don't know. But um, I guess I just, again, I just, I react to what's going on. I don't always, I might play a few notes a little bit different. I might play a pattern slightly different. That's, that's again, goes back to musical self-expression. I don't think a lot of people really understand that um, for what I'm seeing these days. I think a lot of people are focused on too much on trying to do everything like everybody else. And I think that's a bad trap because you're not expressing yourself. You're just trying to copy someone. Music is about expression. It's about what you feel inside and how you project it. Case closed. There's your pep talk for the day. What, for Robert, what 80s thrash band do you feel didn't get the credit they deserve? Credit they deserve? Well, I mean, you know, like it all depends on who some of these bands you compare them to. I think a band that was really, really good. I was very excited when I got their first album, is Forbidden. I, I bought that album when it came out in the later 80s. It was a time when there was no internet and all you knew about any band that you've seen in a record store was either you've seen something a blurb in a magazine you heard about something from someone or you just seen the album in the store and thought the album looked cool or all the above you didn't have any you couldn't really sample stuff so sometimes we buy albums and we'd be disappointed and sometimes we discovered people that's how i discovered fate's warning that's how I discovered Sanctuary. That's how I discovered Forbidden, Testament, all of those albums, all the first albums, Ping Diamond, all that stuff. And I followed a lot of these bands throughout their career, too, watching them expand and develop and grow, which was an exciting time. Um, but as far as a band that could have been bigger, Forbidden, I think, is one of them because they were uh, – they're a really good band. They still do stuff a little bit here. They're not as active as they used to be, but they still put out material and, and albums. Um, but yeah, they're they're a great band and, and a, an album I highly recommend. It's the very first one called Forbidden Evil, and uh, it's just, there's just not one bad note on that album. And I remember for, when I first got it, I was like, "What the hell is this?" Because it was so intense and so it's just such a a reckless, intense album. Really cool production. Glenn Alvarez is an amazing guitar player, great singer. Paul Bostoff is the drummer. You know, it's just a great record and came out of nowhere. We just, that album was an album. I, I went into the record store. I got it. Was, I got it on cassette and I picked up the cassette. I'm like, who's these guys? Who are these guys? You know, and you look at the cover. Yeah, it looks like, a, you know, it was an aggressive looking cover. So, oh, these guys are probably fast, you know. Because this was around the time all the fast stuff was coming, you know, mid 80s to late 80s was a time where, you know, that stuff was all pretty fresh at that point, you know, bands like Exodus and Testament and, you know, these kind of bands. It was all still fresh, that whole movement, you know, which really started, I guess, well, started. I mean, Venom really kind of pioneered a lot of it, but, uh, and Motorhead, of course. But then, of course, you know, Metallica got, in, you know, in, in 83. I remember buying that album when it first came out, too, the very first Metallica album. I was in Calgary, I bought it, and I'll never forget it. I was in a record store. My brother somehow heard about it through a magazine. I went and visited my other brother in Calgary, and I went to a record store, and I found it there, Kill 'Em All. And that was our introduction. It was like, because we never, at that point, you never heard anything like that. It was all new. So, again, it was, you know, it wasn't too long after that, you know, a few years later to the 80s. There was still some really cool bands coming out. Um, Nuclear Assault is another one as well. It's a good band from New York. Um all the early anthrax stuff, SOD, a bunch, all kinds of stuff. I could talk about that all day, but I won't. Uh, I got to see if I can grab another question here. Glenn, do you think we get too dependent on effects? No, I don't think so. I think you can. 
Uh, I personally don't. I think you use it when it's necessary. I think that, of course, it all depends on what we're talking about. If you're talking about just playing, you know, like say you're just jamming, I like to just, you know, if I'm playing, like say, if I'm in the other room and I'm playing along with a record, which I've always done since I was a kid, I'll put on an album and I'll just start playing along. If I'm working on solos, I'm just kind of jamming along and just soloing over it. I'll just put on a lead patch. Too. It's just got a, with the black star that I have, the combo. I just put it on the, uh, the delay setting and just play with it. So it's just distortion and some delay. You know, I think you start playing distortion, you throw on, you know, phasers and flying is cool, but it can be, a, it can, you know, it can get a little bit annoying quickly. So um, it just all depends on what you want to hear, but I don't think we get too dependent on it. No, I don't, I don't think so. I don't really see that. Um, Again, like I said, you can. You can get carried away. I think it's, you know, I think we all go through different phases, too, where sometimes if you, like, you go through the pedal phase, and then, you know, of course, now it's like, you know, there's a lot of compact units. Like, when I was younger, there was no, we didn't have these multi-processors with all these different amp tones and stuff. Like, didn't exist. Amp modeling is only, it's actually really not all that old. It started, I think, I think one of the very first, Amp modelers was the ADA MP1 that came out in 1988 or 89. It was the first of its kind, I believe, where you had a unit that had presets. This one sounded like a Marshall, and that one sounded like a as a boogie, and that one sounded like a Fender Twin. And of course, they didn't sound like totally like that, but they had characteristics of that, I suppose. But that was the beginnings of all of that. Before that, it was just pedals, man. If you wanted certain effects, you had to buy the pedal. You know, now you have like, you know, I with the camper and the, there's tons of them out there, as we know, where you have all these different amp models as well as all these effects in it. So you have your reverbs and delays and all the modulations like the Univibe and the phaser and the flanger and the tremola and blah, 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 and on and on and on. So you have all the necessary effects. But prior to that, yeah, you know, it was all pedals and it could get costly. But, uh, but it was also fun, too, going to get a pedal. I was like, yeah, man, I, you know, I really want to get a chorus. You go to the store and you go buy it. And, okay, now I have the chorus now. You know, I have it. It's added to my, my sound, you know, whenever, whenever you need it. So that was a fun time, too, you know, looking back and buying my first pedals, my first distortion. Like, I, you know, I used to, growing up, I had an app that didn't have a distortion on it. Again, it was like an Acme brand, whatever. And, um uh, you know, because when you're young, you don't have a ton of cash normally. And uh, I just had whatever amp, no gain. So you had to have a distortion pedal because an overdrive wouldn't be enough. So I got Boss Distortion. And when I got my first Marshall, I got Boss Overdrive just to use that with the gain on the Marshall. So that whole industry standard so many people have used, you know, putting a, an overdrive in front, of the, in front of a Marshall head for a tube screamer. You know, that's been going on for a long time. I did that. I got into that trip for many years, experimenting with different overdrives, different heads. I was always very picky with my tone, still am, which can be tormenting, but uh, a necessary evil. Anyway. Lisa, max number of effects that I play with, I won't use a ton. I mean, the most I'll ever use at once. Is a distortion and, and a delay and uh, and a modulation like a, a univibe. Beyond that, it gets a little bit much. I think, you know, I don't use wah that much. I have a really good one that I use sometimes when I when it call when I do when I'm doing something in the studio that calls for it. If you want to get yourself a killer wah, in my opinion, you cannot beat this one. It's by Rocktron, and it's called. The uh, black cat moan. So what it is, it has. It's actually quite extensive. It's the regular wah on it is very. You can hear it. Unlike some of the Morleys that I used to use, I love the construction of the pedal and everything. But the actual, it was hard to hear the wah sometimes. It wasn't intense enough. This one you can control the intensity and it's very intense. And it's also got a bonus feature which is called a moan. And you plug that sucker in and it's just wild. Really, really intense wide. It just it literally growls. It's, it's awesome. 
So if you want a, a wah that works properly and you there's and you can really hear it, I highly recommend this one. All the ones that I've had in the past I've got rid of. This one I'll never get rid of. Again, it's by Rocktron. It's called Black Cat Moan. How much they are, I have no idea. When I was at Megadeth, I used to get a whack of stuff from Rocktron, and that was one of the, the only thing that I still have from them that I haven't got to, that I haven't parted with because I have had no use for it. No problem, Matt. Yeah, my, yeah, SPX ninety. Yeah, you know, it, yeah, yeah. All you know, it's it was all the beginnings of that stuff. You know, all cool stuff. But technology has brought it a lot further now, and so we're getting some pretty cool results these days, as we know. And the Kempers and the GSP are two units that are, you know, display that quite uh, clearly. Kurt, Glenn, you use a half step down uh, using the when I. As far as tuning, I use the Digitech Lamy DT. Um, usually, like with the Knight of Metal stuff, we're tuned to D, so I don't usually change the tuning. Uh, Testament, that's a different story. Their typical tuning is E flat on stage, but yet if they do anything from the album The Gathering, which we usually do a couple of songs, that's C sharp, so it's a full step down from the tuning that we're in, which of course is E flat. This is the pedal that I'll use or the smaller version which is just called drop so we can change the tuning without changing guitars so i've recorded with this i've used it live it's an amazing unit but you don't have to get this one it's more extensive because it has the whammy effect as well as harmonizers and some chorus and stuff like that if you get the small version which is the size of a, of a distortion pedal um it has just this side or this portion here which is just the drop. So you can take whatever tuning you're in and bring it down in half steps and, and, and uh, um, yeah, bring it down in, 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 uh, in half steps. So basically, there's a lot too because if you're in standard tuning, you can go E flat, D, and to as far down as a full octave, actually. So it's a very, very cool unit. I highly recommend it. But like I said, it's cool to have um, the bells and whistles of this version I just showed you. But if you're not going to use the whammy effect, because to me that's more of a toy. Uh, it's cool, but you know, you just play it for a little bit. It's not something you'd use all the time. So it's really, you know, I can count how many times a year that I use it on one hand easily. So um, I, would, I would recommend getting the uh, pedal. It's just called Drop. And uh, it's by Digitech. It's a couple hundred bucks ish, I guess, somewhere around there. And um, I always have it plugged in because if I need to change tunings, which I'm always doing, depending on who I'm in a session with, I don't have to retune the guitar. I just hit it. You know? Example. Right now I'm in standard tuning, I think. So I'm going to start bringing it down in increments of half steps. Very, very accurate. It, it's very stable. The only thing when you go into the lower tunings, it sucks out a little bit of the high end, but you just compensate by increasing it. Here's a big drop from the, uh, I turned the pedal off, but then I brought the tuning down here on the pedal very low, so it's going to be a big drop, you'll see. Very handy device to have. One of the uh, best creations, I think, since the overdrive pedal way back. 
because I used to have a situation where <clears throat> I'd have guitars lined up on the wall outside in different tunings. Now you could just have one and just change it to whatever you want, unless you're doing deep tunings with the guitar itself. Of course, if you do that, I've done the detune thing, you know, with the E string. If you detune that, basically the unit just drops the guitar from whatever tuning it's in. You know, it won't alter strings, obviously. It just takes whatever you have and brings it down in increments of half steps. So. Yeah. <clears throat> Robert, right? Was I at the benefit show for uh, for Chuck way back? Like, was that like two thousand or something? Two thousand two? No, I wasn't there, but I played that ve that venue a few times when I was in King Diamond. It was called uh, the Maritime Hall, and I think it's closed now. But I played there. Actually, that's the first time I met Eric Peterson was uh, when I played on one of the tours with King Diamond. That was actually the night I met, yeah, I think it was the second time I played. And I, that was the first time I met Eric and I met Paul Bailoff that night. He was he was there. We're hanging out a bit. He died shortly after, as we know. But at least I got to meet him, which was fun. Donald, will you be joining us at, St at Stein's Nashville get-together? I don't know anything about that, as a matter of fact. Sorry, Donald. I'm sure it'd be fine, but I don't know anything. I haven't heard anything about that. Jeremy, great question. Ever have band meetings about attire as far as visual, visuals, presenta visual presentation goes, all that good stuff? Absolutely. I mean, that's just, you know, you have to have, you know, it, it doesn't have to be poison, but, it, you know, it, it's... You have to have some kind of, I think, some kind of a cohesiveness to what's going on. Um, there'll be meetings. You know, what we, what we used to do a lot in Megadeth was um, we had a thing with JVC where they supplied us with a lot of, you know, video cameras and stuff like that. And I used to take mine and always put it up front of house, sound guy in the front, who would have it on my tripod and he would film every show. And me and Sean or whoever else later on go back to the bus or the hotel and we watch it or watch parts of it and see what we're doing and what we can do to improve visually or whatever. So kind of like a football team, you know? So that's always important, always to review what you're doing. Uh, having a good plan of attack and have everybody on the same page, you know, is, uh, is only going to make you and look and sound more pro, you know, and a lot of it's just common sense, you know, so it's, uh, it's always a very good idea. If everybody's on their own planet, it's going to look and sound like that. You know, you have to have cohesiveness. You have to have direction. You know, you have to have that thing where everybody is on the same team, in the same room, you know. So it's, that's very important. But like I said, it's nothing that you have to experience to be able to, to do that. It's just common sense, which is where you got that from, I'm, I'm sure. I'm just gonna, I'm gonna sign out in a, in a sec, guys. I just have to. Uh, I don't want to be interfering with what's going on next year in the room. I'm not sure what's going on, but um, I just want to make sure I didn't miss anything. I think, I think I've got all your questions down. I'm pretty sure. So, um, hold on one second. Okay. So yeah, it was. Uh, I just want to thank everybody for coming out. Thanks to the guys, of course, at Guitar Zoom, 
for uh, having this available for us to do. It's a really cool thing, and I hope that uh, some of the things that we spoke, we talked about today will help you in those certain areas, be it, you know, the techniques, you know, recording, guitar playing, and all that stuff, band stuff. So I try to cover those those important things as much as possible. So I hope you guys got something from this session. And again, thanks for coming out. It's fun. It was fun as usual. I'm here, for those that are wondering, I'm here two times a month, which is the first and third Sunday of every month at 2 p.m. Eastern, which is my time zone. So if you do the conversion, you figure that out. And um, yeah, so again, thanks to everybody. You guys all be good, and we'll see you uh, hopefully next time. Take care. Hi there. Thank you so much for watching this video. I certainly hope that it helped you a little bit. Um, if you enjoyed the video, please do me a huge favor and either like it, subscribe to the channel, share it, or comment on it. Okay, that's going to help us out enormously. Um, and then we can keep in contact with you when we have new material that comes out. And if you uh, enjoy the video, we've got some other videos over here that you can watch that might be able to help you on your guitar journey as well. And if you look up on the top there, you're going to see there's a little eye up there. If you click on that, we are going to be giving you a free gift just to say thank you for watching the video. Um, and then if you'd like to follow us on social media, you can use the term at GuitarZoom and you can find us there. All right. So take care, keep practicing and have a great day.